back here on Liquid Lunch and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we're here with uh, David Sarida. And uh, David, hi. It's, it's, it's a real uh, privilege to have you on the uh, air here today. And uh, you're, where are you in this? You're Sedona. in Sedona, Arizona? I'm in Sedona, Arizona, but I'm actually uh, Canadian born, been living in the United States for a lot of my life. Yeah, we've been uh, really studying your material. I understand you were born in Edmonton. Yeah, I was born in Edmonton in 1961. 61. Okay, great. And Sedona, when I actually when I hear Sedona, I, I think UFOs. What's what's the connection with Sedona and UFOs? Well, you know, people there are sightings here and there are, of course the big Phoenix Lights case <coughs> um, which was really famous I think in 1993-97 in that era there was a giant triangle seen from one end of the state to the other and it was seen by over 10,000 people. So there's something about Arizona and sightings. In fact, they go way, way back. Okay. Um, I've seen some strange lights here, but I haven't seen a daylight craft or anything like that. But also in the, in the West, there's been some sightings of California. This my thing not on. What's that? Oh, um, but also, can you hear me now? Here, hold yeah. On a second. Are we recording yet? Or are we yeah, no, we're, we're good. Something was wrong with my uh, microphone. But also in California, David, and, um, and uh, there were some sightings out there, and uh, were there not? Well, I saw a daylight saucer in California in 1968. We moved from Edmonton to Vancouver to Berkeley in 1964. And in 1968, I was on my way home from elementary school, and I saw a flying saucer. I mean, and everyone was going crazy over this thing. There were at least, you know, 50 people in the local neighborhood just, you know, gathering to look at this thing. And after a full 20 minutes, it just went invisible, like, in a split second. And what did it look like, David? Having dreams about it, and, you know, I've been engaged in the phenomena since I was a little kid. And I was a Star Trek fan back then. My brothers and I used to watch Star Trek. There were no markings on it. It was just this, you know, spaceship, and you just... You know, building model airplanes as a little kid, and I knew what the Goodyear blimp looked like, you know. This thing was close, and there's no way you could mistake it for anything else. And David, um, hi, my name is Dionise. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, I just wanted to ask you what it looked like. It was a silver flying saucer. It had, you know, it was very classic dish shape, uh, kind of like a polished aluminum finish. And it was shimmering in the sun, and it had a little dome on the top. And we were looking for the word USA written on the side of it, but nobody could see any markings. And, you know, today the Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Lab is right up on the hill in the East Bay in, San, you know, in, the, um, in the Berkeley area, in the Berkeley campus. I was actually in Albany, which is a kitty-corner neighborhood to Berkeley, when I saw it. So everyone in that lab, which is a national uh, defense lab, would have actually seen it because there are huge windows facing out into the bay. I mean, it, it, was, it was just down low. It was really close. And it wasn't like, you know, 100 feet off the ground, but it was, it was definitely, I don't know, 3,000 to 1,500 feet, somewhere in there. It's hard to tell altitude because of the size. Mm -hmm. And right. I would estimate it was probably, you know, you know, 50 feet across or mm -hmm. bigger. Again, with disks, it's really hard. You don't have wings. You don't have anything to kind of estimate size. And, you know, because there's no markings, you know, you can't really see, you know, the size of the thing. Now, uh, I, you know, I, we, we've been going over your material, David, and uh, from what I gather from going over it is that this, the, the secret that you're suggesting that uh, UFOs uh, need to do to be able to achieve the kind of speeds and, and, and make the kind of maneuvers that they do is that they have to actually transform into light from matter to light. And uh, and you do talk about how some of these UFOs look like they're made of light rather than made out of material. And I'm just wondering if this particular UFO that you saw, did it look like it was made out of material or, or did it look like it was light? No, it looked like it was made out of material. I mean, but the, thing, the fact that it could go invisible in a blink of an eye, I mean, you think of, you know, I teach people this in my films and my books, inertia. Inertia is the enemy of movement. It's both a, the energy of a body in motion and the tendency of a body to resist acceleration. And if you think of a boat moving through the water and you have a propeller, you know, spinning around, pushing the boat through the water, the faster the boat goes, 
the more the water pushes on the bow of the boat, making it unstable and heavy. And the faster you go, the boat gets heavier, and eventually the water will either destroy the boat or the boat will just have to skip above the, t- the surface of the water. So you're limited to your movement, to how fast you can go because of this pressure, this drag that is produced um, by the strata with which you're trying to move through. Now, when you get out of water and you get into air mass, you got basically you had you know propeller airplanes that eventually turned into inverted propellers, which are jet engines, and you can go Mach 2 or 3 today. The X-15 was going Mach uh, 4 and 5 back in uh, uh, 4, 5, and 6 back in 1962, and nobody flies that fast anymore. You know, nobody flies, you know, six times faster than the speed of sound down here. But that's as fast as you can go in air mass. And the faster you go, you can't turn because the G-forces on the turns get too powerful. And the air mass starts to actually cause uh, friction and heat on your aircraft. Actually, it was at the Avro Aero Company in eastern Canada that was the first company to develop F-wing fighters and break the sound barrier. In, a, in an actual maneuverable airplane right around the time that Chuck Yeager was breaking the sound barrier in America in the glamorous Glenis, which was basically a rocket. Uh, Avro Aero in Canada was actually doing this. Um, Dan Aykroyd appeared in an amazing film um, called The Avro uh, in Canada. And then when you go past that you know, story, you get into space, you find it, okay, you can only go so fast through, through air mass. So when you get into space, Space looks like a void. Initially, even Einstein thought it was a void, but he argued with Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics, for 10 years about it. And then he changed his mind. And he changed his mind, yeah. and that it, because if space has energy, as Planck said, then it has to have, have mass, mass because yeah. energy and mass are equivalent and equals mc squared. So when they found it had mass, of course, what happens is you can't really go into this infinite velocity because the fabric of space, just like water, starts to push on your spacecraft. And then you get into this problem of even if you can attain even one-tenth the speed of light, which is doable with certain exotic nuclear fuels today, um, although we're not attaining speeds like that today, but it's possible, um, what happens is if you have to turn to avoid an incoming debris, or a planetary body or an asteroid, the G-forces on the turn are going to kill you. So you can't go towards the speed of light through these strata, and plus the strata is pushing on you. So the question is, when I saw the UFO go invisible, why did it go invisible? Well, picture yourself, you're two fish, and you're sitting under the the Atlantic Ocean, and you want to go from uh, New York to England. And one fish goes through the water, and the other fish you know, realizes that if I go through the water with my buddy, it's going to take me months to get to England. So one of the fish leaves the water, it, and to his buddy underwater, when he leaves the water and he goes into air mass, this more, less dense strata, he literally disappears from view from his buddy under the water. They both separate from each other. And when the fish goes above the surface of the water, you can see these little kind of shimmering wavelets as he's, the fish above the water is near the surface of the water, and when he gets higher and higher up, you can't see him anymore. He's invisible. And that's kind of like what happens when, when UFOs, essentially, they don't move through space. They don't, what I'm saying is, they found out how to get out of the, out of the dimension of space and all of the problems with inertia that are in it. Okay. And, and that is why they're able to move much faster. And ultimately, when you attain singularity, which is the highest discovery in quantum physics. And what I've done in my book, Singularity, is, is merge the highest teachings in, in uh, the Old Testament, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, all of the great masters. And I've, I've merged them with the highest teachings in quantum physics. And we found that this language that they were speaking in, in nobody could understand until today, until we had a closer look at the atom. And we found out that the cause of why mass cannot move faster than the speed of light and can't even attain the speed of light. It can get to 99.99%. But the reason it can't is because of what it is coded with. And in fact, in the, the Nag Hammadi Library, one of the Gnostic uh, uh, manuscripts that was famous, made famous because of Dan Brown, but was well known far before him, uh, there's a, a, a manuscript called the Apocryphon of John where it says, after the fall from grace, that humanity was cast to the lowest region of matter, 
not the lowest region of the universe geographically, but matter itself. So we look at what, what is the fall, and is the information in the fall encoded on the atom? And sure enough, it is. If you look at what the fall represents, it represents the forbidden knowledge of good and evil. And God in the Old Testament says, if you take in this knowledge, you will die. You will die. So there has to be something wrong with good and evil, the, the whole thing, not good and not evil, but the whole thing. And if you see the whole thing in its, in its entirety, it's a conflict. So if you go from this initial state of oneness or singularity, which is just a theory at this point, and you take in duality, what happens is you become a conflict. You, be, you radiate with a lower vibration than singularity. In fact, uh, way, much later in the game, Paul Dirac, a, a quantum physicist, discovers that singularities do not allow dualities to exist inside of them because simply uh, um, a duality is a conflict of, of actual energy on the subatomic level, and they can't exist in the singularity. So the singularity spits it out. So if you think of consciousness actually taking in good and evil, what it did is it took in an inner conflict. And it went from a state of love or union where there's no conflict, peace, which is a state of union where there's no conflict. And we actually think of the word yoga. Yoga actually means union, union with the yes. whole. You can't be in a union with the whole when you're divided, when you're in this divided state. So you fall into conflict. And eventually we egoify the conflict and we say, my religion is right and yours is wrong. We say, my interpretation of my own religion is right and somebody else inside of my own religion is wrong. And so religions divide, divide, divide hundreds of times. And then the single religion divides hundreds of times and so forth. And then eventually uh, the religions, the different religions fight against each other, each one thinking they're right and the other wrong. We go to war. And <clears throat> this, this, the evidence of the conflict is very clear in civilization. I mean, it, it's here. But it's coming from within us inside of us. And what's interesting now, in the greatest research being done in the consciousness quantum physics world, we're finding that consciousness is the authority on matter itself. It started with, um, for people who saw the movie What the Bleep Do We Know, and Dr. Emoto, Masaru Emoto, takes these photographs of water, frozen water crystals. And the I remember this, yeah. Work like this. The you, you, you think a negative thought to a, um, a glass of water, and Dr. Emoto freezes that water in a cryogenic chamber and photographs the water crystals, and you see this chaotic kind of crystals. And then he, takes, he does another experiment where you think a beautiful, loving thought to the water, and then he freezes instantly that water, and you see this beautiful crystalline structure. And he does this over and over and over again. It doesn't matter how many times he does it, when there's order and harmony, the water crystals are beautiful. When there's chaos, <clears throat> the water crystals are, you know, are chaotic. So that was the first experiment. But then people wanted to know more about how is this process occurring? How is consciousness affecting matter? And <clears throat> what I did in my book, Singularity, is I actually started researching deeper and deeper into quantum physics experiments and seeing how they fit into the model of duality and singularity that all of the great masters spoke of. And I found it was very, very clear that this, this was a perfect match. And we found there's a scientist named Walter Schemp, who in the 1990s in Germany was the first scientist to prove an intelligent atom, that atoms were talking to each other all the time. And the way it works, is we take a very simple model of um, Niels Bohr's atom. We take a proton and an electron, one proton, one electron. So the proton in the core of an atom is like a giant sun, and it's spinning clockwise. It's positive, and the antiproton is spinning negative. And then you have this electron, like a planet, spinning counterclockwise around the proton, and the anti-electron is spinning you know, positive. So you have these dual particles spinning away. And what's interesting is when the electron jumps, shells, or changes diameter or radius or wavelength. When it goes into a shorter wavelength, it goes higher frequency. Niels Bohr found that the atom emitted photons or light rays. Okay? And then when the, atom go, jumps, the electron jumps to a longer wavelength, which is a, a greater diameter or radius, the atom 
would receive photons. Now, that was well known in the 1900s. But what Walter Shemp discovered is just like we're talking on the radio right now, you can tag information, the human voice, on a light wave, which is what radio is. And television is tagging information in the form of pictures and voices on microwaves, which are light waves. Walter Shemp discovered is that atoms were doing the same thing, that these photon emissions and receptions were not blank. There was real information on there, and atoms were talking to each other at the speed of light in this enormous, limitless field of space-time on a regular basis, which means if I'm telling the, the atoms in my body I hate you or I'm frustrated, then those atoms tell all the atoms in my space they, the, the airspace around me to tell the atoms in a glass of water in front of me to do the same thing. And so that's actually how the process is occurring. So what's interesting and what is a big revelation is that that if, if consciousness is the authority on matter, and for those who don't believe that the fall in the Garden of Eden um, really happened and it's just some big myth, all you have to do is look at the atom and see is Adam's Adam, Adam and Eve, is, is it the same thing? Well, it actually is. If you look at the Adam, it's positive and negative, good and evil. It's a perfect reflection of duality, of the dual nature of the mind, of the collective human consciousness. So we are telling our atoms to be in duality, and what duality does, it is the cause of cellular aging, disease, and death, which can be proven scientifically. It is the cause of why an atom can't move faster than the speed of light. This was proven by Paul Dirac. And it is the cause of, of, the, of the first inertia I call is the psychological inertia of war. What causes us to be in a state of inner conflict, disharmony, is because we get into this space where the ego thinks we're right and the other guy's wrong, and we waste our enormous psychic reservoir of energy on that internal conflict process. So what happens is to attain true peace on earth, every individual has to eventually see that I am telling the atoms in my body what to do through my subconscious. And I was born with this code called good and evil, positive and negative energies, that are not in harmony with each other. So therefore, they are exhausting each other's energy and leaving a very small amount of energy left over for me to live with. And that process eventually leads to a decay in our actual atoms in our bodies in our DNA that causes us to die in the end of our life. So God actually predicts this in the Old Testament. He says that if you take in this knowledge, you'll die. And it's not that God will kill you, you will die because you're going to go from a state of love and light into duality and conflict and in your actual atoms, and, and that is going to cause you to age. It's going to cause you to go to war. So if, Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the proverbial Garden of Eden is not something that, that God is doing. It's something that is just consequential to taking in that knowledge. And so every religion in the world becomes guilty of dividing itself, dividing itself, and, and saying, you know, we have understood more than you, we're, we're more superior than you, and we form a higher you know, synagogue, church, uh, you know, Buddhist. But I, I just getting... You know, on uh, and on it, David, just getting to this a little bit here, um, I was reading something by a chap named Goldstein on uh, One Dharma, and I remember that uh, in his studies of Buddhism, in his case, he um, found that, you know, with all the different studies, even with the Buddhist culture itself, or with the Buddha, Buddhism movement itself, there was many sub-movements and people having a different approach to what awareness was, or if you get to a certain state, you're beyond awareness, or the top state is awareness. And he realized that it was like he doesn't know, and he doesn't have to know. What he wanted to find was really the common point. And that's where religions might work, uh, is where you find, I guess, what is good in your own backyard, what you grew up with in, in your religious or belief, find the common point. And then you look at, you, you, you find what's good in that it, I'm sorry, you find what's good in your particular backyard as far as religion or your belief system is concerned, and you find out the common point in other religions. So I think that um, that would be a, maybe a form of, of singularity if it worked, if we got our act together. And when I think in terms of, of, of uh, 
our bodies being broken down to whatever the parts of our bodies are, to particles, to smaller particles, to smaller particles, until we get to the points of molecules, and then we get on to um, uh, protons and, and uh, electron clouds, and then that's even broken down themselves, I suppose, into photons, and, 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 and it all comes down to different versions of waves going at a certain frequency. We've come right down to union with, with the universe in a way. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the first part of what you're talking about is we waste all of our energy in the form of money in, when we go to war with each other. Obviously, we lose huge human resources. But then we waste our psychic energy in our religions just fighting with each other about the differences. And if you focus on the idea that, you know, this isn't a, this isn't, um, a contest with God. We're just trying to have a, an experience experience of oneness you know for those of us who want to experience god or god consciousness we want to experience it and getting into fights and arguments about whose religion is better doesn't really serve that process in any way if you want to have your experience of unity but if you focus on what's if you go across the board in all the great religions you'll see these teachings on duality and singularity are there of course and then when you get yeah. into the studying how consciousness ultimately is subconsciously telling the atom what to do, you see a perfect match. You see this duality in place. And, when, and as you were saying, when you get into the subatomic particles, when you go, okay, first there's the proton and the electron, and the proton-antiproton becomes a duality, and the electron-antielectron becomes a duality. But then you find out that the proton is made up of quarks, and all the quarks are dual paired. You have your up quarks, you have, you know, basically have six quarks. You have two sets of threes, and they're all dual paired. And when you, when you keep going deeper and deeper into the atom, you get into taus and anti-taus, neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. Um, the neutron, which is where most of the mass of the atom is, is also there's the anti-neutron. So everything is reflecting this duality. It's really fantastic to see it. But what's not fantastic to see is that the cause of suffering the cause of the experience of suffering in Buddhism is duality. The cause of suffering that Krishna speaks of, the, the Advaita, is the duality itself. And then Jesus, in the Gospel of Thomas, um, repeatedly speaks in the language of duality and singularity. And in fact, he even says that you can move mountains, whole mountains, if you make the two into one. And it's this language is so consistent with what, in fact, it's really only Paul Dirac who, who is the one to discover the true cause of all aging and inertia and why atoms cannot, you know, move faster than the speed of light. And he finds in bubble chambers when he looks at um, electron-anti-electron pairs, electrons are the lightest of all the subatomic particles we know of. I mean, they're lighter than the than the, the constituent components of the, of the uh, quarks. But the hold on, David. What are quarks. anti-electrons uh, pairs, for some of us who don't know? Like, there's the electron... The electron, pair. essentially, is the negative charge that spins around like a planet. No, but I mean uh, the anti-electron. I mean, what is that? You got the electron, and then you got the anti-electron. Well, the, electro the anti-electron is essentially the opposite of the electron. Uh, they weren't discovered until the 1900s when we realized that first we just thought we had a positive and negative atom, proton right, positive right. and an electron negative. But as they zoomed in on the electron, they found that it had a dual partner on its own. That okay. no matter where you observed, you saw two. Okay. There was ne never one. It doesn't matter where you look. And then you got into this idea. And what's interesting about what I'm about to tell you is it was a philosopher named Krishnamurti, Jadu Krishnamurti, who was an enlightened master from India who who lived in Southern California and, and had a great following and wrote a book called The Awakening of Intelligence. And he has these dialogues with a famous quantum physicist named David Bohm. And Krishnamurti was trying to get David Bohm to see that the observer is the observed, that they are mirrors of each other. And Bohm was so frustrated trying to have this experience that the observer is the observed it took him years to get it, and Krishnamurti got very frustrated, but it was Baum who eventually figured out on the quantum level, which means quantum just means amount. So you're looking at the amount or quanta 
of the atom in small, which is what quantum physics is. Right. He found that no matter where you observed, the, you could not actually make a pure observation without affecting the observed, that brain waves, the observer was affecting the movements of the subatomic particles. So you couldn't, you couldn't actually see things as they actually were without affecting them. And what this means is it's possible that we're seeing the electron anti electron only because we're giving the quantum universe those instructions because okay. our consciousness is trapped in duality. So okay. if, an, if a Zen master were to look at the atom, he might see something completely different. He might see a singular atom. Now, he David. Might see oneness. So what Dirac discovers is he sees these electron anti electron pairs, he, they strip them off the proton which causes them to spin into infinitely shorter wavelengths or higher frequency orbits to the point that they radiate off all of their mass energy equivalent and attain zero mass, which now, is what I'm proposing these spaceships are doing. Okay, David, then, David what's that? I just want to interrupt you there for a second uh, because we're going to take a little bit of a break. But, uh, okay. but just pertaining to that particular point, I wanted to ask you this. So are you saying when these uh, spaceships... Um, go to zero mass, can they travel faster than the speed of light? Well, that's what Dirac discovers. Dirac discovers if, you, if an atom, atomic pair becomes single, non-dual, it can travel anywhere in zero time, not faster than the speed of light, in zero time. That he went, oh my God, it was an epiphany. And Dirac, this is in Dirac's, Dirac won the Nobel Prize with Erwin Schrodinger for wave theory, but in this particular paper, he was rejected by his peers because he was way ahead of his time. Okay. And Dirac actually realizes, oh my God, if you enter this singular field, you can travel anywhere in the universe in zero time. So that means, that means you really have the God particle. The singularity is a field where there's no resistance because inertia, resistance to movement, is caused by duality because positive and negative actually push against each other. So then you get into a deeper question, well, why doesn't light travel instantly? Why is the light from Andromeda 2.2 million light years old? I mean, why can't we see distant stars as they are right now in real time? And that's where it gets more and more interesting. Okay, Let's David, we're going to come break. we're going to yeah. come take a quick break, come back, find out the answer to that question, but also before 2 o'clock, we're going to find out what the, all this means for us living our lives and how we can achieve singularity to banish all suffering from our lives and from the world in general. So that's all, right. all coming up in the next half an hour here on Liquid Lunch. We'll be right back with David Sarita. If everything's ready here on the dark side of the moon, play the five tones. All right, we're back here. I don't know who's picking the music here. But that's a ridiculous song. Some aliens. <laughs> Imagine. Okay, listen, uh, we're back here on Liquid Lunch. We're speaking with David Sarita and uh, Denise. You're loving this. You're, you're, I you're am getting it. So in this. Okay. This is really fascinating right. stuff. And I have a question. Can I ask David well, something? Well, let me. Yes. It's quite but serious. Let me just do a little bit of a recap sure. before we ask that question, because what we've, uh, what we're figuring out here, we're it started in the Garden of Eden. We're living in a world of duality. It's the cause of all suffering. A, uh, UFOs can go faster than the speed of light, which is great news because even, even at light speed, uh, David, uh, you know, 4.3 light years uh, years to get to Alpha Centauri, A or B, or is Andromeda. too much for me. Uh, you know, that's a lot of food you got to pack. Let's buy uh, tickets. And um, so we're so th that's all good news. And I'm hoping we can get to some real strategy. What this tells us about the nature of reality and and how, what we what we can take from this to solve our little problems, to end suffering and that. So we want to get to that. Wow. But Denise, you got a question yes, first. Yes, David, I have to go back if you don't mind. What you're saying all makes sense. Absolutely fascinating. It all has uh, scientific backing, and it just really makes sense. But I really wanted to know, did the aircraft that you saw as a boy, as a young boy, did it make noise? Did it have an engine? Was there any type of heat coming out of it? I really wanted to know that. Oh, no, it didn't make a sound. I mean, it, not a single sound. It was just glistening in the sunlight. And if you look at pictures of the Billy Meyer spaceships from the Pleiades uh, that he took in the 1970s, um, which I actually was amazed was on in Vancouver, Canada, was on a TV station there. And it wasn't until I saw those photographs that I went, oh, my God, that's what I saw when I was, you know, seven or eight years old in wow. Berkeley. And I think the UFO was there actually... 
because of the riots in the 60s. I remember the tear gas riots around Vietnam and barely getting through the campus. My dad was getting his Ph.D. in psychology at Berkeley in the 60s, and you know, he was from, um, from the prairies. Right. And of, El, of the, the Great Prairies in Canada, Saskatchewan. My dad's from Sheho, Saskatchewan. And there he is getting his PhD in the 60s, and there's these riots, and then there's the flying saucer. I really think they were just watching this new, you know, rebellion against, you know, the war and this emergence of this new consciousness, and it was just following us. Why do you, uh, oh, sorry. Um, to be heard. Why do you think, has, have scientists uh, figured out why it makes no noise? That's such a valid... Well, Good see, we have moving parts, and moving parts produce inertia, friction, resistance. And when you consider the principles these UFOs are working on, the most advanced civilizations, not all UFOs are using the singularity principles, but essentially when you get out of, even when you get out of air mass and you're traveling through space, a spaceship is essentially virtually almost silent as far as noise, because noise is produced by um, waves crashing through the strata of air mass. And when you get into space, I mean, things get quieter and quieter. Even an engine doesn't make much noise. In space, no and one can hear you scream. And then imagine when you get in your whole, all the atoms in the spaceship itself are vibrating in these higher frequency dimensions. They just don't make any noise. And they don't, gravity doesn't even have much effect on them. In fact, in my new film, From Here to Andromeda, a four-hour miniseries, we got an interview at Lockheed Martin, America's number one defense contractor with a scientist who worked in black projects for 20 years. He worked for Howard Hughes, Texas Instruments. He designed the Stinger missile. And he says on camera how anti-gravity works and that we shot down the Roswell flying saucer in 1947 with a super weapon that was classified even back then as it is today. And he's testifying to this on camera. And you can search this guy's name, Boyd Bushman, on USPTO.gov and look up his patents, and the, the, the ones that are non-classified are there, and they all say Lockheed Martin on them. So this guy is who he says he is. I went on Fox News to tell everybody this news, and it's a revelation. CNN was afraid to run the story. You know, really? I was with uh, Dan Aykroyd for my Dan Aykroyd Unplugged on UFOs DVD. We were on Anderson Cooper, and, and you know, they, they did this huge piece on, on the release of our film, and all of a sudden, when it comes to a Lockheed Martin senior scientist saying this is all true, they wouldn't do it. They just ran the other way. David, so, who's driving these things? Well, that's where the questions get deeper and deeper. You know, you, if, you, if you start asking questions like that, you start scaring more and more people from the truth. I mean, they're star beings. If you go back to the time of Pythagoras, the great mathematician and the founder of modern music is Pythagoras. You know, famous for the you know trigonometry, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Pythagoras in in Jamblichus, the the biography of Pythagoras's life, it's very clear that the Pythagorean school focused on purification techniques that it gave you the ability to see into the invisible, to hear what nobody else could hear, and he believed all of the planets, the nine planets that we know of, um, there were nine in his time, but all of the planets were inhabited by beings who had tenuous bodies, he said, bodies of light. Did and he actually had experiences with these stars. That's Maybe it's the ask. Mayans. I was just going to ask you that. He, he had so an experience. Pythagoras, and, you know, I, I talk about him in my book, Singularity. Right. And he's saying this. Pythagoras is saying this. And John Nash, in Beautiful Mind, you know, the, the, the mathematician who wins the Nobel Prize in economics in the movie, he said he was receiving messages from extraterrestrials. And everybody says he's schizophrenic and they electrocute him. And he said these, mm. these extraterrestrials were teaching him. Now, Pythagoras said the same thing, and he didn't get electrocuted. He didn't get, uh, he didn't get thrown in an institution. But John Nash did. Why? The question is because we're not ready to handle this. We don't really – we're still looking for a spaceship to be flying through space and to see it coming just like an ocean liner across the Atlantic and calculating the arrival – the time of its arrival based on, you know, just under the speed of light when it's going to get here. But they're not moving through space. Once oh. you realize that, they just pop into our dimension, and they hang out, and they, you see them, and then they go invisible. Well, with the advent of the little digital cameras that have been coming out, people are taking pictures 
on vacation, and when they download their photos in their computer, there's a flying saucer right in the middle of the, of the picture. They couldn't see it with their eyes when they took the picture, but it's there, and they are here. They are appearing to people just like they did to Pythagoras, but it's happening on an invisible dimension. Pythagoras said you had to purify your mind to be able to see these invisible dimensions and have these experiences. You know, I've been practicing meditation for 30 years now on a daily basis, and believe me, if you practice this stuff, if you practice what is core to any of your religions on this planet, yeah. from all of them, they have teachings that can give you direct experience with and that's God. That's the good part of religion, when it works right. Um, yeah. I, I think that uh, meditation... Uh, I remember a uh, uh, um, chap uh, worked with a book with another chap who was into Buddhism and another chap who was a rabbi, and they did uh, this book, I forgot the name of it, where you, you uh, clear the mind in meditation. And in a Jewish religion, it's something about filling the mind with, uh, with good thoughts or whatever or dealing with being one. Um, uh, but I was just thinking, when we're doing this right, when you're doing your meditation, you're tremendously at ease. You're one with yourself or you're one with the universe. And then you can take a step back and look at the things without an A, B reaction, but it sort of take a C reaction, kind of just take a look, take a pause, and then make your step. Um, and uh, when people are so scattered with so many other thoughts and, they're, uh, and then there's this friction, as you suggested, and what I, I think we've guessed before we even met you, there is a lack of that oneness, that ease. And so we have that duality, the dis-ease of ourselves. And that thinking, that dis-ease, comes from you know, the emotion or whatever that causes uh, the reactions or the bodies, the illness that happens from, you know, like, you, like the reaction, you gave the experiment of the ice, the, uh, the ja Japanese scientist or whoever who... Uh, Atari late, Moto, yeah. Yeah, and, and so there was a reaction where it was perfect synchronized uh, geometric form of the ice crystals when the person was in clear thought process and uh, it was total disarray when someone was totally emotionally unbound. Anyways, I found that very interesting. Now, can I ahead. just add to that, yeah. to Daniel, yeah. uh, and for you, David? It seems to me that the, the big news here, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, but uh, UFOs, whatever, propulsion systems, all that stuff, the real big news here is that we're in this uh, stuck in this world of duality, this world of suffering. It came from the Garden of Eden, and we're here. We're stuck in it. But are are you giving us with this book, Singularity, and with these ideas? Are you giving us a way out of this? Like, is there a way for us oh, to transcend absolutely. this? What I'm doing now is I'm taking. I'm actually doing a new film right now called The Voice, where we're actually showing all these scientific experiments of the mind. We have the world's first. 3D camera or imaging software and technology designed by Russian physicists. This new film on consciousness is really going to blow people's minds. It comes out in January. But what I'm doing now is I'm designing meditation CDs that will be coming out also in tandem with the film that through my 30 years of practice, I am translating into a Western format without all of the technical jargon so that people can see this. Now, the simplest thing you can do, like, in Buddhism we have what's called insight meditation. And insight meditation is don't just sit there and blank your mind out. I mean, that's not going to do anything. Meditating is about becoming more aware. And if you don't become aware of the duality process inside of you, you can't come to a place of harmony a second to that. And the place of harmony leads to these unified field states of oneness where you go into supreme states of ecstasy. And this ecstasy can exterminate all depression, all suffering, the experience of suffering. In fact, Buddha said, Buddha never claimed to be God or a God. He claimed to develop a system that is the a method that, that eradicates the experience of suffering and gives you bliss. That's all he claimed. People turned him into this huge icon, and he is a great icon, but he really was a very humble practitioner who realized that if you do this practice, you will experience no more suffering. And what happens is Buddha's language is very complicated for a Westerner. And Jesus' language I particularly like for a Westerner, but even his is coded. For example, in the Gospel of Thomas, or first with Matthew 6.22, Jesus says, If thine eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. 
What is, what is single? So people changed the word single to simple, and they ruined it in the further translations. But in Thomas, Jesus says, when you were in the light, what will you do on the day when you were one? You became two, but what, when you become two, what will you do? See, this is a language, and what I do is make it simple for people. The language is when you were in the light, you were one. You were in this state of oneness. But when you became two, when you took in the knowledge of good and evil, you became a conflict. And think of two giant ocean waves here. I mean, one wave is just cruising along towards the ocean, towards the beach. And then another wave comes from the beach to meet that wave. And when the two waves hit each other, you just get this huge explosion. What's left over, one of the two waves is slightly stronger than the other. That's called the difference or differential, and that either moves towards the beach or goes back out to the ocean. Now, if your goal in life is to get to the beach, the, the dual function of the waves is exhausting all of your psychic and your spiritual energy. So if you become one, what Jesus is saying, you end the conflict. There is no more duality inside of you. You become filled with light, with ease. There is no more problem. I don't have to go to war because my religion, I think egotistically my religion is, is beyond yours. And, and that is where we waste our energy, our financial resources in going to war. So the question of light gets even deeper because the light that we see coming from the sun is not traveling instantly. As you said, Alpha Centauri A and B are 4.2 and 4.3 light years from here, so that's a long trip. And then if you look at Andromeda, our closest galaxy is 2.2 million light years. So that's no good. How do you see the universe right now? And why is light traveling so slowly? Well, Einstein said that if light were to travel in a true void, it would travel instantly from A to B. But the problem is the universe is not a void. Why light is traveling so slow is light is the only particle, wave, that spins positive and has no antiparticle in it. So there is no negative light wave. But what Paul Dirac found is the fabric of space, that black fabric that the light is moving through, produces negative pressure. And that negative pressure is attracted to the positivity of light, and they push against each other and cause a huge, enormous duality. So once again, um, light is trapped in duality. So the singular light that Jesus is speaking of, that the God of the Old Testament is speaking of, that Krishna is speaking of, that Buddha is speaking of, is a greater light. And you get into, as you study deeper and deeper mysticism in Buddhism, Buddha had to attain seven levels of samadhi over 400 lifetimes before he perfects nirvana, the seventh. Yeah, seven, so day, seven days ago. The lights actually get greater and greater and greater and more and more pure until you reach truth singularity and se the, seven days of creation the light uh, I think um, light was mentioned uh, the meaning of light was mentioned I think in the first couple of days but the actual light from the Sun didn't come till what the third day of fourth day of creation I think right See, there so, you the, go. so we're talking two the different waters, lights there the different waters above the firmament and below the firmament and those are strata yeah those are strata that we move through that God is talking about actually all of the words of God in the Old Testament in Genesis if you're, a, if you're an astrophysicist or a quantum physicist and you listen to what I'm saying, it's all perfect. Mm -hmm. And that proves to me that, that this is not a myth, that yeah, this right. is absolutely the truth. Here's but, something I want to share with you just for a second. Uh, this is out of uh, Gerald Schroeder, who I studied with in Jerusalem uh, from MIT. Uh, it said here there's a nuance in the Bible that may pretend these discoveries or it may just be coincidence but it is interesting nonetheless we read at the closing of the six days of genesis and quoting god saw all that had been done and behold it was very good genesis 131 in the 19 in 1900 in the 1900 year old translation of genesis into aramaic by the sage ankylos the read the verse is read not as and behold it was very good but as and behold it was a unified order Unity and order were a stamp of completion. So that again, it's 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 relating. Everything's related to the to uh, unity again. Well, yeah, exactly. that's really. I didn't know that, and that's that's fantastic what you're saying. What's yeah. interesting? It, this is really where it gets really deep. Is why we fell originally into duality yeah. when we lived in the singular light is the greatest of all questions, and you find that. 
in, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism, in a dialogue I had in my new film, The Voice, with Robert Thurman, that the initial first light that we were all created in equally, which is also in the Nag Hammadi Library um, manuscripts um, in de-Christian mysticism, Gnosticism, is that that light was blissful and happy, but eventually we got bored of being in that light. I know I was. In, to, in Tibetan <laughs> Buddhism, these these primary lights, which for us are an epiphany. If, if a person does yoga today or meditation and attains the first samadhi, they'll be blissed out of their mind. But eventually you get bored of it. And what suffering does, by going into duality, suffering... Um, Thurman described these first samadhis as self-absorbed bliss states, bliss states that are for the removal of my suffering alone. And so the aura tends to stay in a sphere just a few feet beyond the body, and it's all white and I'm happy. But it's not the same as nirvana, the deeper levels of light, where your aura merges with the entire cosmos. What happens is after you've suffered for thousands of incarnations, or even one lifetime even is enough, you slowly either get really, really angry or you become compassionate. You look at another person who's suffering and you go, oh my God, I know what that feels like. And your aura merges. It becomes not interested in this small egg shape or ego sphere of yourself and you suddenly care about others. And when as you care more about others, your aura gets bigger and you go into higher states of light. When you have compassion for somebody else's suffering, even if you're suffering, in that moment, your suffering is gone because you're now filled in this state of love and empathy. Right. And, and that's what starts to happen. Buddha realized that all samadhis, this is in what's called the Lankavatara Sutra, all samadhis one through six, which he says many yogis attain thinking they are fully realized. Even yogis, he said, in the third samadhi will tell you that they've reached the highest God consciousness because they're so blissed out. But he said those states will all expire. They are impermanent. The only one that's permanent, he says, is nirvana, the seventh. And in order to get nirvana, you have to come all, and, and this is all the way up to the sixth samadhi. And Buddha was born in the sixth state of samadhi. He had access to that state, even though it was impermanent. And what happens is, to get to nirvana, Buddha says, you have to come out of your self-absorbed bliss, do something for humanity, to uplift humanity, and be completely non-selfish, and then you get the grace to enter the seventh. And the seventh is so fulfilling, it's so beyond all pleasures, all imaginations, that it is perfect, perfect peace and bliss and light. And it is a light beyond all lights. And Buddha said that is the goal of, of spirituality. Now, we so were that not might created in nirvana. We that were might originally only created in, in the Buddhist equivalent of the, on the Hindu equivalent of the first samadhi. So we have to attain the seventh. So the, the super enlightened masters of that level, which I believe, you know, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, um, and you have all the feminine masters as well, um, you know, every what's really interesting too is a lot of the great masters that were always a feminine counterpart. For Krishna, it was Radha. For um, uh, for for the Tibetan father of Tibetan Buddhism, which is Padmasambhava the Buddha, he is with Yishis Jagyal, and now some people are saying Jesus and Mary Magdalene are a pair. You can go down the list. You'll find these divine feminine master counterparts. And there. David, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's uh, I just don't want to lose my train of thought. You've touched on something. And really, the more I'm listening, none of this is really new because weren't uh, we living this way in the beginning? I mean, the Mayans, if we believe in that and study them, didn't they know all of this and were practicing no, it regularly? I culture did. I, I think... All the, I mean, from what I've seen in studying the Mayan culture in the Aztecs, is anyone who would do human blood sacrifices could you could not be in a state of oneness and and union at the deepest level that Buddha is talking about. At that level, violence is caused by conflict, mm-hmm. and if you do, and if you end the internal conflict over good and evil, you become single. You become filled with peace and light. And such a person is, would never be capable of harming another human being. So they weren't practicing the full positive side of it. I mean, when you read about them, I mean, they obviously left their bodies, it says, became light and moved on to another See, dimension. When you become light, it doesn't, what, what, it doesn't guarantee you. 
I mean, for example, Robert Thurman was saying this in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When you die and you go, you, you attain some of the early stages of samadhi, which are much easier to attain when you don't have a body. They're very blissful. But eventually you get bored of this bliss, and then you go, you want to suffer so that you can get compassion and ultimately get the higher lights. Okay. So just because a person is in light doesn't necessarily mean they have reached total singularity. There's still there's still traces of duality in some of these lights, and the duality emerges when a person actually desires to be human again and suffer after sometimes even living. The Tibetans say you can even live thousands of years in these refugee Tibetan, for the Tibetans they're like paradise cities, but eventually you get bored of these states of bliss and you decide to come and suffer down here again, which is a really horrible thing to think about, but then eventually you get nirvana, and nirvana is total, total freedom, and that is what the Buddhists and um, that's, strive for. And that's what maybe Adam and Eve were thinking, who knows, I don't know. I think, no, I think Adam and Eve were in the first clear light, just like the Nag Hammadi Library, Trimorphic Prochanoia tells us that the first beings were all created in the first light, right. and they eventually partook of duality, right. which which is horrible in the beginning, but ultimately leads to these higher levels of life. Is this secret information, David? Is this something that the uh, higher authorities of the world have always known, and scientists are just catching up with their own smart knowledge and figuring it out? Or is this well, something that's being revealed now? I don't think many scientists have figured out singularity. Singularity is something that, you know, when you do this stuff, 30 years I've studied all world religions. I've been sitting and meditating Sometimes, you know, three hours a day, and on certain retreats you do 12 hours a day of sitting meditation, and you experience this stuff. And then I started working with many of the top physicists in the world on nuclear fusion and bomb detection. I was around, you know, people like Glenn Seaborg, who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission and fathered the atomic bomb. I was around, you know, Bogdan Maglitz, who invented helium-3 fusion, Murray Gelman, who won the Nobel Prize. All these people were I was working with, and I had to study physics every day just to be able to dialogue with these guys and when and i started to see a pattern i was like i've been studying world religion for over 10 years and now i'm studying physics for over 10 years and i'm going oh my god i can see this and as i got more and more on the cutting edge of quantum physics i found the teachings of paul the discoveries of paul dirac on singularity match perfectly with the highest teachings in all religions and that's what my book singularity is all about it's about that that relationship, David. Um, this this is obviously I can see why uh, uh, yeah, George Nury and Coast to Coast and Art Bell do three hours with you and still not enough time and we're and we're probably only so skimmed the top of things. Uh, but I was just wondering, uh, can we have us just a small taste when you're talking about we're jumping back to the uh, what you we're talking about is more important, but. Going back to the actual spaceship, mm-hmm. uh, if we actually made a spaceship, uh, how would one work out the anti-gravity, as you call it, to, uh, I, I guess we're converting the ship to waves, work out uh, the wave propulsion and um, frequency and so on to get to, to, get to uh, far away like Andromeda? Or is that maybe we should leave that for another day? Well, it's a deep subject, but essentially, if I could explain it, Maybe in an overview, yeah. The first prophet in the Old Testament is Enoch. And Enoch, actually, if you really read clearly, it looks like God, the, the supreme ancient of days, appears to him in a disc-shaped object that's glowing with light, and God's face is so bright that nobody can look. Enoch falls flat on his face. And if God is to be able to be efficient and travel around the universe in zero time, he can't be traveling at the speed of light. Um, obviously, that's way too slow. That's cool. And okay. Andromeda's too far. He has to be using singularity. Now, that obviously we know that, that the atom is coated with this duality, and that is the cause of why mass can't move at the speed of light. But it's also the cause of gravity, because um, polarities, polarity matrices, dualities, are what keep things attracted to each other. Planets and suns are all attracted to each other. And if you look at the only thing that's actually defying gravity on Earth is light waves. They are singular in, in, a, in a small sense. They attained a very simple type of singularity, but they're still bound by the matrix of duality. But light waves bounce off of the planet and go out into space. And gravity can bend them a little bit, but it doesn't stop them from getting away. 
So now if you take the duality of the atoms and you produce, and you have to, this is in my book Singularity for those with really good minds, you can see how dualities produce differentials, and differentials eventually, if they're configured right, lead to anti-gravity. And, but it's a very complicated subject. No, that, that's cool. I understand. Boyd Bushman at Lockheed Martin and I, in our sit-down, in my movie From Here to Andromeda, we, we actually really get into this on camera. And he shows us things levitating right in front of us. Okay. Wow. So, now, David, listen, we're, we're just about out of time here, but uh, I'm just wondering if in the last few uh, uh, moments here of the, sh- of, of the show, if you can, based on your, uh, your understanding, your theory of singularity, can you give us any advice to take away to help us as individuals who many of us are tired of duality. We're tired of the struggle, the strife, the suffering. What what can we do? Can is there something we can do using this knowledge? Yeah, that to to meditate with the insight of first just seeing on everything we do in our life internally, we get into a conflict about it before we even produce an action. Whether we're going to start a new business or we're going to find our soulmate. We can see this person in front of us. Should I talk to them? Should I not? Oh, I'm nervous. Well, they might not think I'm crazy. That's duality at work inside of you. Should I start this new business or shouldn't I uh, because somebody else is going to go into competition with me or it's not going to be successful? That's duality. That's how we waste all of our energy. And my new meditation CDs that will be coming out, um, we'll have to do another show when when the new film comes out. Oh, that'd be great. Um, okay, so is that is that it? Meditate. <laughs> well, meditation with insight. You can't just with insight. blank your mind out. You have to see this conflict going on inside of you. But then, when you see it, then just don't give it. Give it less and less energy, less and less importance. And as you become more detached, in Buddhism, detachment is neither a clinging nor aversion. It's non-duality. So when you, Buddha says, don't reject anything. Don't. Uh, don't, and don't be too attached to it. Just be aware of it. Oh, so yes. once you're aware of this conflict going on inside of you, just be aware of it. And yeah. then slowly, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, there it is again, wasting exactly. all my energy. And slowly, slowly, you get free of this. Is, you'll notice as you get free of it, you have more energy. It, is Dan Aykroyd very much into this along with you, your, your friend? Who yeah, Dan you Aykroyd listened to a copy of my Coast to Coast AM show on Singularity, and he said it's his favorite thing. He said, oh, my God. He said, Dan Aykroyd said Singularity is the, is the most amazing thing he's ever heard of. That's what he said. In fact, he told Anderson Cooper that on CNN. Yeah, so I have uh, seen yeah. that out of our segment because Anderson didn't know what Singularity was. Yeah. David, listen, we've had a lot of fun today. Did you have fun today? Oh, yeah. I, I love talking to you guys. And can I tell people where they can get the book? Oh, please, yes, please. please. Yeah. If you want to get Singularity, you can only get it online. You can either download it for 10 bucks or buy an 8 by 11 copy. Um, it's at www.lulu, which is L-U-L-U, dot com forward slash David Sarita with no space between David and Sarita. And Sarita is spelled S E R E D A. So uh, that's lulu.com forward slash David Sarita. And, and you, you, you'll see Singularity there next to my other book. And that's the only place you can get it. So you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it anywhere else. It's, it's the only place. All right. Uh, how about your website? Uh, is that worth, uh, should we? Uh, yeah, my that? website for my current film is um, from here to andromeda.com. Um, Andromeda is A N D R O M E D A dot com. From here to andromeda.com. And that's my new, that's the film that I have out now. Um, and my new film, um, The Voice will be voiceentertainment.net will launch in uh, December, January. All right. Well, listen, it's been, it's been great. We had a lot of fun, mm-hmm. David, and thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, we you love, guys are great. I, love, I love to, ha- love to have, you, have you back any time. And thank you, Daniel, for uh, setting this up. Well, th- it was all David. So. And, and thank you, Denise, and thank you, Damien, and thanks, everybody, it. for listening. That's it for the show today. we got to head out. Uh, okay. Stay tuned, and, uh, and we'll see you uh, tomorrow at noon.